midst of a huge transformation where peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, and I'm a Partnerships Manager here at All Voices, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Today, I'm excited to welcome our next guest, Andrew Zuckerman. He is the VP Head of People at KIN. Andrew, how are you doing today? I'm well. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. If you want to start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, how did you answer the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my name is Andrew Zuckerman, as you mentioned. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I was really interested in sociology, social sciences. Um, I think it's how I ended up getting into, into HR, but I, I sort of wanted to be something to do with people, whether it was a psychologist or whether it was an anthropologist or whatever it may be. Amazing. And fast forward to now, it's definitely related to HR, but what's your why for getting into the people space and just the industry in general? Yeah, absolutely. So when I graduated college, it was right at the end of the, or the beginning of, excuse me, of the 1% movement. And so it was an interesting time because a lot of people were asking things of their employers that they never asked for before. And employees were sort of stuck between traditional relationships with employees, but also a new generation coming into the workforce. If you remember, there was sort of this great millennial scare of all the things that were going to change in corporate America because millennials were entering, which is so interesting now as you get scared about Gen Z. Um, so I got into HR because I thought the, 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 in, the tension between new employees and employees in general and companies was really interesting, and I wanted to help both parties navigate it. So I ended up going to grad school in New York and NYU. I studied a couple different things, but I really was excited to, to be a part of, of easing that, that tension. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And you mentioned just the changing role of like how people and employees are communicating with, with HR and just with their people teams in general too, and with the new generations of you know, folks entering the workforce as well. Um, for Kin specifically, you're a B2C company, 50% of your employees are sales reps and the other 50% are technical and insurance experts as well. How do you really mesh those two like company cultures together in a holistic strategy for one Kin team? Yeah, it's a really, it's really difficult um, task because I, I feel like we have two paradoxes going on at Kim. One is to exactly what you just said, we have 50% of our folks really on the front lines having a completely different experience and the folks who are more on the corporate side of things who are the actuaries and HR and marketing and all sort of those traditional corporate functions. We also are a tech company, but we're also an insurance company. And in this mm -hmm. insure tech space, you have this interesting paradox because you have a super forward tech company where you're riding scooters to the office, <laughs> everyone's wearing a t-shirt, all yeah. the way through a very traditional insurance company where people just don't behave like that. Yeah. Um, and so in this B2C market really, or in this kind of B2C culture, what we tried to do is figure out what our core values really were and what it meant to work at Kin. Because regardless of your function, you should all experience this. And we do funny things like one of our values is running through walls. And no matter who you are, you get a yellow brick when you run through a wall. Certain people are incentivized differently, but the idea of employee incentives remain the same. The idea of our values remain the same. And we also do a lot of mixing. I think Donut, if folks have heard about it, is a great tool. And we purposely integrate our two sides of the house so that even though people have a different day-to-day -day experience, they're connected to this general feeling that working at Kin is like working like no working at an insurance company like no other. And that's the big goal. That's the value proposition that we, that we put out there. Change your perspective of what it means to work in insurance, no matter what your function is. But also recognizing that those cultures are different, that sales has a different culture mm -hmm. and we need to have meetings and incentives that are specific to those groups but also recognizing that the other side is different and they want different things so it's been a really interesting challenge but by tethering it to the overall ideas of employee incentives a fun and engaging culture and a different way to experience insurance has really helped us you know maintain a holistic strategy yeah, absolutely. I mean, it sounds like a lot of fun. I haven't heard of one of the values of another insurance slash tech company being running through walls. Were you there when you kind of developed those those values? Yeah, I was. Um, and it was a really interesting experience to, to walk into because running through walls has always been an idea that we had here, right? Mm -hmm. Running through walls, be chill. But how do you actually bring that to life? We have another one, um, LFG, which I don't think is probably a good, you could probably pick up what I'm putting down by LFG, which probably isn't podcast uh, appropriate. But <laughs> you know, I think what's really interesting is that our co-founders came up with these ideas. 
And when I joined the can, uh, can about nine months ago, we hadn't really found a way to bring those things to life. We had said to people, go run through walls. It's better to do the wrong thing than do nothing at all. We had these words, but we never found a way to really do it. And so I got to be a part of an experience of bringing those core values into a physical space. Like I mentioned, we kind of printed out these yellow bricks that said can on it. And we would ultimately go ahead and give them to people who ran through walls. We did running through wall awards. We ultimately brought those words into our performance reviews and our engagement surveys. And we celebrated people who did crazy things, who did things that fundamentally changed the business, whether it's reaching um, a new actuarial, you know, we use technology to do actuarial pieces. So whether it's finding a new way to do that, which is super insurance and interesting versus like totally killing your sales goal and having someone who runs through those walls and there's a big celebration and when you're back in the office we literally will throw bricks off the stage <laughs> and it's just really fun and engaging yeah. so it's been cool to be a part of bringing those core values to life because i think a lot of companies have core values now but i right. think there's a lot of times of real struggle of bringing those core values into a way that people feel like they're not just words on a wall that people really live and embody the spirit of what you're trying to put out there yeah, absolutely. And over this past year as well, it sounds like there's been a concerted effort to make the environment really fun and engaging in person, but so many people have changed their employee engagement strategies throughout the pandemic and work from home. And as we're thinking about going into the office, a hybrid approach or a remote first plan, um, what changes have you made to internal processes or strategies at KIN over this past year that will really be long lasting past the pandemic? Yeah, I think it's really hard. So Kin grew tremendously during the pandemic. We yeah. grew over 125 people. That's that was crazy. almost that was almost we almost doubled our population, which was a really interesting point of challenge because you not only had to transition culture into a remote, a remote space, but you also had to create a fundamentally different culture because 300 people is very different than 150 people. When I started, we were we were almost 90. We hit we hit 295 as of today. That's wow. a huge growth. So really, that's about 200 yeah. people now that we've hired. Um, and so some of the long lasting strategies that we've done are really identifying ways to mix people. So I talked about Donut before. I think Donut's a tool out there that really helps people engage with the organization. And every three weeks, Donut will randomly match 24 people, but we've set it up, we work with, you know, two pairs of 12 related to 24 people, but we've set it up that it always mixes people. And eventually when we go into the office again, and, and we do plan on going back, you know, when it's safe to do so, um, these people can go out for coffee, right? And there are silly things like they take selfies and the best selfie gets $50, right? We've done mm -hmm. silly things like that. Yeah. Well, there's a way of giving people virtual kudos. We'll do something called dinner on me, where if you've done a really good job or you've worked late or you've done something just cool, we'll send you 50 bucks on Grubhub and say, have dinner on can, you've done a great job. And those are things that can always transition. And I think the third is really kind of recognizing that um, transparency changes. And so a lot of times, right, certainly the pandemic made transparency even harder, but as you get bigger, you have less time with executives. It's not 20 people in a room with a co-founder talking yeah. about other things. You're not struggling to make payroll anymore. You know, things have changed drastically. We just raised our Series C, about yeah. 75 million million. So we're in a totally different space. Um, and so one of the things that we've really done is incorporate ways we can bring transparency, doing bi-weekly all hands making sure we're sending out notifications. You know, we have a general channel on Slack where our co-founders will post major updates. So whether you're in sales or whether in the actuary side, you know the products that we're selling, you know the states that we're launching, and you know these pieces. We have ways to bring communication up. People will ask questions on Slack, and I think we'll continue that experience, certainly a little bit more in person, but that level of transparency that we brought will continue as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important in terms of communication as well with with employees, and we talked a lot about celebrating, engaging employees, the other side of it too, which I'm sure you're seeing as a people leader is so many people want to contribute to the business, especially half of the people that you mentioned who join the organization, that it could lead to burnout. How do you like proactively think about preventing burnout on your team, especially with managers um, and in your kind of day to day? Yeah, burnout's tough. And particularly in a startup, particularly here in Chicago, it's fast paced. Mm -hmm. And part of it is accepting the fact that it's that it's fast paced. Yeah. But um, the other part of this is better training managers to identify the signs of burnout. Okay. You know, when employees start missing deadlines or you mm -hmm. start seeing people a little bit more frazzled in meetings, I think you have a tendency to say, why is Andrew having a bad day? Or why is Andrew emoting at work? But not thinking about what happened. 
And so you start finding that a lot of people feel exasperated. It's just the natural cadence of things. You see the reality, or just the natural reality of things. And you see, you see this, and the articles have really supported this as you study employees, that because there's no balance anymore, because people don't leave the office and shut down, you find that those rate of burnouts are, are coming up. So we've trained our managers to better identify the signs of those things. Like I mentioned before, and if people are acting a little bit differently, they're starting to miss deadlines, they seem to be reacting disproportionately to a situation. These are early indicators that someone needs some time off. The other part of this is that we watch our PTO. Unlimited PTO is a great thing. Many companies have instituted it, but many challenges lie with unlimited PTO because people tend to be a little bit afraid of taking it, right. particularly in the startup world. So we actually watch our PTO. And if you haven't taken PTO in a quarter, we will tell you to go and take it off. We will give you a day. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. We're like, get out of here. Go take a day, <laughs> go and do something. But we also too will recognize that there's an ebb and flow to things when there are big projects done. So I think about our trainers in sales. We had a huge class for six months that we had to train to meet the growth that we had. After those six months, we set them golfing in South Carolina for a few days. We really think about those experiences. You know, my team has been crazy with recruiting. We put out almost 25 offers a month. Next week, my team is starting to slow down. They're all going to a game. They're all going to a Cubs game or they're all going to do something. They're all going to take that time off because that's really important. And so identifying those signs, identifying ways to express gratitude through time off and, and frankly, sort of forcing people to take time off is really, really important as, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really, really important. And especially for PTO as well. I know unlimited PTO, like you said, is something that's common a perk in startups, but people, there's science behind it of saying that people don't take it. So you need to encourage them to, to do it. Um, another piece of just the major growth and scaling plan as well is making sure people feel included in the culture and that they belong and that they, of course, stay um, and tell their friends about, you know, the company as well. Can you tell us about Kin's diversity, equity and inclusion strategy, what the goals are and what really that that entails on the people side? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things I'm most proud of at Kin is we just did our engagement survey and commitment mm -hmm. to the organizations at an all time high. We are at 95% positivity. That's a huge. Wow. Yeah. It's far beyond, right? It's, it's incredible. Right. And what it says is, is that people are dedicated to the mission, that we are really trying to change an industry. We purposely give our employees equity so they feel like owners. And you can see that that strategy is working. In terms of DNI, I think about two major factors. One is on the HR side of things, we have a responsibility to cast a wider net. There are so many conferences and organizations. I think about um, Black Girl, I think it's Black Girl Coding. I think there are things like women in product and mm -hmm. ensuring that we're going to these events and ensuring that we're bringing representatives at our company to go to those events. Yeah. And really casting a wide net because there's such great diversity of talent out there. Right. But the challenge is, I think, is when you rely on traditional models of knowing people. We have a lot of people from insurance companies. So, and with insurance, you bring in other people from insurance companies. That model is correct, but there are ways to do it that augment the model, that make that model even more expansive, open barriers to entry and allow us to do that. So the very first thing we did is expand our recruiting efforts. The second thing we did is identify different barriers to entry. So sales and customer service tends to just be an easier place for folks to start. So when you look at folks who may not have had the education or experiences that you may need on some of the corporate side, and just given the systemic realities of, of the world, you can put them in these lower barriers of entry, get them into the organization and train them up. I'm really proud of something that we call um, internal mobility. Um, we're very Kardashian-like here. You can put a K in front of a word. Yeah, I'm just I'm noticing that. Yeah, we, we love a good, we love a good uh, Kardashian like mm -hmm. fun here. And one of the things I'm very proud of is that we have moved in my time here, been about 10 months, we've moved over 15 people throughout the organization, particularly right. out of sales and customer service into more corporate functions. And that tells you that we can bring in people who have great potential. We can better identify that potential in folks who may come from a diverse background, who may not come from a diverse background, but really better identifying that talent on the ground. And then we move them. We do product boot camps. We do different ways to train you on the organization. I'm really proud to see that half our product team were actually customer service reps three years ago. That's a huge win for us because you see these people growing, certainly the economics and their financial investments with salaries go up and you're very proud of what that is. So that's the people side. On the internal side, we focus a lot on education. Right. When I look at DE&I in the organization, I think you start with the high level and then you dive deep. 
So we have two things in play. One is we do general education. We look at unconscious bias. We look at different barriers to why these systemic problems exist. Why is HR even opening these different doors in the way that they're doing doors? And why does this all matter? right? Because there's an educational piece. And I think a lot of companies have recognized that in the last year or so that they have a lot of catching up to do. And that catching up has to be education. And it's not that people don't care. It's that people don't know what they're supposed to care about. Right. They just don't know. So we do that. And then we also have, um, we call it conclusion, of course. (laughs) Um, We call it conclusion and belonging. And we have like kin community conversations. And I'm so proud of myself for getting that right. But everything going on, during the George Floyd um, um, trial. That was tough for a lot of people in our organization. We have a large population of of black employees and it was tough. And the reality is at at Kin with startups, you have to come to work every day. You have to go to sales. And one of the things we recognize is that you're asking people who are going through an emotional time, right? During that trial, there were a lot of other police shootings that were going on. There were a lot of things going on with the pandemic and the economy and people were struggling and recognizing that people struggled at work meant that you had to create a space from talking out and we just hosted three groups and we just talked it out people talked about how hard it was for them people talked about you know the fact that they didn't know certain things you know you had employees of all backgrounds of all ages of all different spaces just come together and talk and learn and communicate and those deep dive conversations are so important because when you create empathy in the organization you allow yourself to have an authentic culture that doesn't feel performative but ultimately creates a space where you can better understand the human to human relationships and better understand the human being with the people that you are talking to which of course you know leads to that relationship so huge mouthful to you but you can tell my 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 rate of speaking and all the different (laughs) examples i'm very excited about this ken has really put out a statement to say that we are going to do these things we are committed to de and i we are going to find a way to get back to the community and really for a startup that's grown tremendously that's grown so remote i'm very 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 proud of the work that we've been able to to bring forth here Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like there's a lot of things that are happening there and it's really been a priority for the organization in a multitude of of ways, which is really great. And it's manifesting in different events, programming, um, and of course, pipeline and talent as well. Um, In these conversations, there's so many questions around how do you measure progress of starting? And you can measure that in terms of the number of organizations you partner with, um, the pipeline, the talent, but also, um, as you mentioned, creating empathy within an organization is a really important goal. But something that is maybe a little bit more intangible in terms of measuring that? How do you really think about um, kind of what you look towards to say like, oh, we're doing a good job towards this. We need to move the goalpost or, you know, we have achieved this goal. What are your thoughts around that? It's tough. And I think it, the question you're asking me is emblematic of about tough it is quite frankly. <laughs> and I think part of it was accepting that some of this is intangible. Yeah. And sometimes you have to accept the fact that you can have more players in the organization. You can have more events in the organization and it may feel better, but how do you measure a feeling? So I try to focus our metrics in two areas. One is the engagement survey. Do people feel like our company is committed to DEI and do they feel safe that they can be themselves and bring their own opinions here? Mm-hmm. There are great questions and organizations like Lattice or Culture Amp that these have these engagement surveys really allow you to ask questions in a way that's formulated by people who know better than you. And that's a huge thing, right? I want to rely on people who know more than me in order to do this. Um, the other question I really like is how committed do you feel like senior leadership is to diversity? And that's a huge indicator. And I really feel strongly about that number because if people feel like your senior leadership is committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, people will then feel like the whole company is. That's really important. I think the other portion of it is is general engagement. Who's coming to these community conversations? Who's engaging? Is it all levels? Are we getting the right traction? Are we giving the right things? And the third is recruiting. You know, I don't think it's just numbers. I think it's really important. And I've always felt this way that a lot of recruiting teams have focused on ways that would say, if we're going to bring three final candidates into an interview, one of them has to be a person of color. And I don't disagree with the intent, but the impact is, is you create affirmative action in some ways. And that could be really difficult. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a controversial idea, but I never want people to feel like we are forcing people in the interviews to meet a quota because that sends a message that's wrong in the organization. That sends that this person may not be as good as the rest, but we're gonna send them through. 
or it may say we're only putting this person in because of the color of their skin and that's inappropriate to me and so what i try to measure is what are the number of quality applicants that we are getting following the events that we've gone to what are the number of people we've actually hired if we're looking at folks across the board how many times have we compared a female candidate or a person of color to a white male at the very end round and when we're in these feedback sessions are we typically hiring on this side? Are we hiring more white males? And why are we? And there's nothing wrong with hiring the best talent. That's the ultimate goal of recruiting. You hire the best talent for the job. But if you notice a pattern of these things, it's more being aware of them. So I really focus on both the increase of applicants, but the quality of applicants to meet the fact that we're going to be really intensive about hiring people because I never want to meet a quota and I never want to hold roles for certain things because it creates a sentiment in the organization that isn't fair and that isn't right and already puts people of color or different intersectional backgrounds or whatever background that may they may have into a position that already says I hired you in some way because of the color of your skin and I never ever ever want that to happen it's about finding great people opening doors being considerate during the feedback process, right? Looking for words like, did this female candidate come off too aggressive? Those are words that you see. And I'm proud of the fact that here at Kin, we've really taught our people to be thoughtful of those things. And so really measuring the impact of, of again, I'm tripping over my words, but I'm so excited about this, of, of really just finding great people, getting them through the door, being thoughtful of how we're evaluating them and ultimately setting everybody up for success on an equal playing field. And that's the equity piece. And that's why I love that there's been an E included in DE and I, because it's creating an equitable playing field for people to come into the door. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the way in which you find great talent is what you said in terms of partnering with organizations, being at recruiting events and being super intentional, not only using like four schools to recruit from or just like referrals or all of these things to get that diversity of, of talent as well and people through through the door. You mentioned this a little bit in terms of feedback and the engagement survey, but what kind of strategy do you really think about when you're thinking about kind of a holistic employee, like getting that good, bad, ugly feedback? Yeah, you know, one of the things I really focus on is you break down roles to their atomic level, mm -hmm. right? Certain times you need a level of experience doing things, right? And as you get bigger as a company, as a startup, you go from really smart, high potential people who've never done something before, but you know they can, all the way through, you need someone who's already done this. And that's a natural transition as your company matures, but by breaking roles down, by saying, Beyond an engineer, yes, you need a certain level of technical expertise, but do you have the tenacity? Do you have the soft skills? Do you have the communication? Because I believe that if someone has tenacity and if someone has um, a desire to learn, who has a certain level of you know, expertise that's appropriate, any of those people can be successful here. So my strategy is in terms of feedback is really breaking things down. People oftentimes will find they will rely on a gut feeling and then rationalize it away, right? I, I liked Christina. I would go to a bar with Christina, but also her expertise is really great. And I like the way that she communicated, I like the way the questions are. There's nothing wrong with that. We're, we're human beings, we rely on gut feelings. But understanding on the upfront, those two things. One is on the back end, ensuring that we're breaking things down atomically mm -hmm. so that gut feelings are really looked at to say, is this the best person for the role? because they bring a base level of skill that regardless of their expertise, they need to bring in. And you'll see, I keep saying the word tenacity because that tenacity, that grit, there's a great book called Grit. That is the number one- By Angela Duckworth, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Over and over and over again, that great study about West Point graduates. You can bring in 20 great people, but unless they have that tenacity, they're only going to, only some of them are going to succeed or the only ones with tenacity often that will succeed. So that's number one. The second is ensuring that we're doing kickoffs correctly. Do people understand from the very minute that we're kicking off a role to the very minute that we're hiring people at the end of the day, that people understand what we are looking for. And when you give them those, those, those atoms, you'll often find you get to a better feedback session because people aren't relying on gut feelings. They're relying on different areas that they know they should be looking for in addition to those gut feelings and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I love the word tenacity as well. So I definitely uh, resonate with that too. I'm um, going to definitely see that you're passionate about these topics and just, you know, working at KIN as an organization as well. Um, kind of bringing it to your like expertise as an industry leader too. So not necessarily at KIN or organizations you've worked with, whether you've seen it in the news or just, you know, whatever, um, you know, however you came across it. 
Um, for in terms of employee engagement, people strategies, or just like the new world of work that we're in right now, have you seen any kind of missteps or mistakes in the way people go about things where there's like, this is a great intention, but it didn't necessarily land? Um, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yes, interesting question. And I think you've noticed two things happen. One is employees over time have become much more open about their mental health and well-being. Wellness yeah. has become much more mainstream and COVID has only pushed that through. And I think a lot about our HR role that a lot of times HR people have to play therapists. And so it's helping people understand that the experience, that relation, it's really about the relationship between company, companies and their employees has been transitioning and that has transitioned hyperdrive. So I believe that people should feel like they can bring 90% of their people at work. There's a great, um, there's a great podcast where folks get interviewed from an HR perspective and a, a, a wonderful woman, I can't think of the company that she works for, um, mentioned this. And I think that's right, that people should feel like they could bring almost all of themselves to work because the reality is you don't get in the elevator and shed your pieces to it. Right. And so how can companies better respond to things? It's training managers in emotional intelligence. That is the number one thing. And I believe that many companies are missing training that because they're hearing all this exasperation. They're hearing all this things on burnout, but they're sort of just ignoring it because mm -hmm. people don't know what to do. And I think having emotional intelligence training, it's something I really feel strongly about giving our managers to not only, like we mentioned earlier, better understand the science of burnout, but to better ask the right questions in one-on-one. -on -one. So it's not just like, hey, Christina, how's it going? What's your problem? Yeah. It's like, hey, Christina, like, I'm sensing like you seem a little off today. Like, what's going on? Like, mm -hmm. how are you feeling about things? Like, right. you're in the middle of a project, what's going on? And really being able to express that empathy because employees want a relationship that's human to human. And I said that earlier, and that human to human relationship matters. It is not company and employees. It's not about wearing business casual work and jeans on Friday anymore. Yeah. Because employees don't want a relationship that's formal. Employees want an informal relationship. They want to be able to say, as anyone would, I'm really good at my job and you can trust me and I don't need to dress a certain way, and talk a certain way and engage with you and have a certain kind of relationship with you in order to be successful at my job. Those three traditional pillars have, have crashed. Um, the other side of things is really benefits. And I think you see a lot of these ancillary benefits. Um, things like IVF treatments or maternity and paternity leave or honestly volunteer days and various things that tech companies and maybe some companies out in San Francisco or New York or coastal companies have kind of pushed that bar, but most of corporate America is not doing that. And really being able to bring those benefits in, IVF rates have gone up, I think they said by 20% during, during COVID. And one of the things that Sherm has talked about is, should employers be better suited to be giving benefits to people like that? Because the nature of the world has changed. People have adjusted to this new world. Flexibility, certainly we've talked about, we don't need to go into remote work and flexibility, but people are changing their personal lives. And so being empathetic over here isn't just checking in. It's also as a company in a macro level, being really thoughtful of those things. And I think I've seen companies not react to that. Companies are traditionally very conservative. That's the nature of things, right? But mm -hmm. companies have to better anticipate, okay, these things are changing. People are focused more on mental health. People are expecting different sort of medical benefits because their lives are changing. People, you know, one of the silliest things I say is like with our benefits, like we found a provider that you can just text for a medical card. People are like, oh my God, you can text <laughs> for a medical card. Like it's so stupid to say that, yeah. but like the world has changed because you're so much more mobile now because of what's going on and all these different, you know, tertiary little examples. But I think companies have to better be prepared for engaging with human beings on a personal level, both in terms of the macro with these benefits and with how the policies are interacting. And, you know, people have policies around data and how you use data at work. And that's different all the way through the micro. What does it mean to be a human being at work? How are you feeling? What's going on with you? Are you struggling with things? And how can I help you? Because managers aren't just meant to be evaluating your feedback. Managers aren't just mentioning, you know, we're not just going from my, you know, back up. Managers went from a place of you do this job for me so that I can get things done to I'm managing your performance and I'm coaching you to now that we are peers and I'm a mentor to you. I want to care about you and help you grow. And I think companies aren't here yet, but they have to get here because people are over here now. 
And as the new generations get into work, you are already over here and companies are still over here. Yeah, absolutely. I hear a lot of things coming out of kind of that, that answer, which is really exciting in terms of innovation. You can't use the excuse, this is the way we've always done it, whether it's an industry or an organization. Also, the way we measure effective leadership is different and the role of managers are changing. Um, and then the role of mental health and just benefits in general, as you mentioned, there are so many uh, different options out there for, for companies and also just to have that human to human interaction as well is really, really important. Um, Another question I have for you, which is more on kind of your personal experience is, do you have a proudest moment, whether it's at Kin or, you know, throughout your experience as well, where you were in that moment of flow thinking, I definitely chose the right profession, whether it's big or small? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think it's hard to pick one, but I think one of the things that people should know about getting into HR, one of the values is, is you have an opportunity to make a real impact. We have a power that we've never had before. And certainly on the macro plane that liaison, right? I'm very proud of the fact that I've worked with people in the organization here at Kin to build those community conversations. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of the fact that we have an engagement that's so high because people feel like they can simply express themselves in Slack and we have a culture of transparency. But so I, I guess I say to you, there are a million of these micro moments where you feel to yourself, I did a good thing. I made a difference for people, whether it's over here or whether yeah. it's my, whether someone comes to you and they're stressed out or they have a weird question or about benefits and you kind of understand it. Like your job is to unknot things so that people can engage with work in the least stressful way possible. And I feel really proud of the fact that as myself and my career has grown, my ability to make an impact for people has really increased. And I love that because at the end of the day, recognizing, I think, this dinner on me thing. You know, we've had employees who've struggled, who have had things going on. And to be able to give someone the $50 Grubhub gift card, people are like, thank you so much. I just want to order dinner tonight. Like, it seems so silly, but there are these moments that matter. And I'm very proud of the fact that I've done it. I, I feel like as I've gone in my career, I've been able to do a better job of identifying those moments that matter and helping people recognize that it isn't just birthdays and anniversaries. It's, you've worked really hard. I'm going to send you on a golf trip. You've worked really hard and I'm going to get by you dinner. Or I just want to send you a quick Slack to say, hey, someone gave me some good feedback. And I just want to say, I'm really proud of you. Thanks for doing that. You get to do that in HR. And I love, love, love that we get to play that position. I'm excited to see this, this next evolution because if we can train managers to be more empathetic, you're not only giving managers the tools, you're also giving people the tools and you have a better, healthier organization and people are just happy. And that could, this can't happen. What we just talked about cannot happen without HR. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's an opportunity for huge impact as well. You're also one of the first people that people meet at a company too. Um, so the face of an organization, which is exciting. The flip side of, or just an opposite question too, is um, what is like something that keeps you up at night as well as a leader? Yeah, um, there's um, there's three words that give me <laughs> HR sweats um, and it's necessary operational expense. Okay. And that is in many organizations that HR is a necessary operational expense. But the second you become that, you lose the value within your organization. And I think one of the challenges of HR is that you, because of what's going on, and certainly before COVID, but COVID has exacerbated this, you have a major seat at the table. You are the face of the organization. You are responsible for the culture and community. And we have to find a way to engage with people. We have to find a way to coach. I think so much of my job is giving advice and giving feedback. And HR people have to be really thoughtful and really have a strong point of view. And so they're not just doing the, the, what I call the brainstem HR. They're not just filing paperwork and being compliant, all the things that we need to do. Right. But what keeps me up at night is how do you do that? Because <laughs> HR people don't know how to do that. And it's not because of HR. It's yeah. because no one knows how to do that. But yet you're the one being asked to do it. Yeah. Right? I think about Calm. Calm gave HR people a free year of Calm, which is so emblematic. <laughs> of that. HR people are like, what do I do? And so one of the things that keeps me up at night is I think about my team is I have a responsibility to my people. And how do I train myself and my people to react to all these things? We're talking about so many awesome things and a great place that HR is in, but HR, it's scary. We've never been asked to do these things. The graduate programs, and I, I was in grad school, you know, six years ago now, so it's hard to say, but are the programs teaching correctly? 
for people who don't go in these programs? Like, are the HR leaders themselves trained correctly so that they can train their teams? What is that tension point, you know, in this inter-HR relationship? And that that scares me at night because I don't know. And I'm yeah. reading a lot of books and I'm like highlighting everything and I'm really excited, <laughs> but I'm like, I don't know if this is going to work. Yeah. I'm sort of just going with it. And that's fine. Yeah. People go with things, but no one knows what they're doing. And that's really, or people know what they're doing or people taking their best guess, I should say, but right. that's hard and that's scary. Definitely. And I don't want what to happen is I don't want us to go backwards. I don't want yeah. HR people to go back to that necessary operational expense where you become the people that only pop out during performance reviews and you come the people that people are sort of afraid of. And like that phrase, you know, don't owe HRs in the room. That like makes me cry because I'm like, no, I'm here. I'm fun. And like, yes. I don't care. <laughs> have a beer at work. Don't have 20 beers at work, but have right. one and I don't care. Yes. And that's just such an interesting relationship because our relationship with the organization and our relationship with the employees has changed as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I was talking to someone else and it came up in the conversation of just like when COVID happened and, you know, forced remote work happened and all of these things, it was like HR and the people teams are really what do we do to solve this? What do we do to solve everything and anything that comes up? And it's just like, you have a major decision-making seat at the table, but also it's just like, I don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty. So um, that definitely makes sense. Yeah. Our, we have talked about a lot of different topics today from your experience to Kin to all the programs that you're doing to industry shifts. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to share or like a key takeaway or insight you want our listeners to to you know leave on yeah no I don't think so but what I what I would say is I think podcasts like this are critical because what happens is and I think about myself is many HR leaders are alone I am the only <laughs> person right I, like, yeah. I am the only person in my role and I don't have peers and I have my team who is phenomenal and I'm so proud of them, I can rely on, but many heads of HR are the only other heads of HR in their yeah. company, right? And so, and your role is so unique, who do you talk to? And so podcasts like this, there are different Slack groups, you've noticed HR advisory councils and different HR groups. And my takeaway is get involved in these things, mm -hmm. ask questions of these people because we ourselves are a community. And I think there are things like Sherm or traditional models that are hard to maintain in a digital world. And Sherm has done yeah. great things. It's nothing, you know, negative of anything, but sure. we have to find a way to engage in a digital space with each other. We have to build a community. We have to build conferences and speak to each other and engage with each other because if not, we're always going to be alone and we're always going to be reading articles or sweating at night reading books <laughs> when really the reality is we have a collective power as well and i really encourage anyone listening to this or any of the hr folks that are out there to really find each other to engage in each other folks want to reach out to me reach out to me join these slack groups get out there and and work together to do something because we together have an opportunity to change something at a much more powerful level than we do alone i love that that's a great call to action and just the power of community especially in these roles answering these big questions is really important and also did you hear that everyone you can reach out to andrew on linkedin and he'll, uh, he'll talk to you as well um but thank you so much seriously for being on the podcast and for sharing uh your thoughts this afternoon we really really appreciate it yeah absolutely thanks so much and i'll talk to you very soon Yes, absolutely. And as a reminder for folks who are listening, All Voices believes in the empowerment of everyone to speak up at an organization and thinks it's a requirement in order for folks to succeed. And we'll speak soon.